Strap on your thinking cap. Socially conscious talk that's entertaining with a dash of humor and the top sports stories of the week. It's time for Ain't No Half Steppin' with Marcus J. Sellers has Jordan. Jordan with two seconds to go. Puts it up. It's good at the buzzer. Michael Jordan has won it for Chicago. Manning lobs it. Burris alone. If you're lying, then you must be half stepping. Yeah. Ain't no half stepping with Marcus J. Back live once again for a live show. Get down with us tonight. 804 562 6160. 804 562 6160. Be down with us. Ain't no half stepping with Marcus J. We're live on MixLR. We appreciate everybody who's down with us tonight, listening to us. We got a live show. We got a lot to get into. Uh, tonight, we got a filmmaker based in Atlanta, Georgia, who's going to join us in Dosi Angabwile. who's going to join us to talk about the process of making films and his inspirations and things of that sort. Young filmmaker. Definitely look forward to giving him some shine here on Ain't No Half Step and with Marcus J. Uh, this is Black History Month, so we're highlighting aspects of black history uh, as we've done uh, throughout the month. We had his dad on uh, the first week of the month where we talked about Brother Man, Dictator, Discipline, the comic that's been in existence for the last 20 years. Uh, then, of course, we had the black business uh, with Miss Rashida Moore. Last week, we had the ancestor of Chicken George and Kunta Kinte, Miss Beverly Johnson. And this week, of course, we're excited to have Ndosi on the Buile on the live line with us tonight. Of course, we got your man K-Dub, who's going to lead us momentarily on the National Basketball Association conversation. Uh, then we ask him what the hell, because as it being Black History Month, there's a lot of uh, incendiary things that Marcus J definitely wants to get into tonight. It's not going to be one of those what the hell segments where we up in here grinning and smiling and stuff. It's some stuff they got a brother pissed. Mm. So we're going to talk about that. Ain't no half step with Marcus J. It's live on MixLR. We appreciate the love. Of course, in the second hour, we got the dating pool diva that's going to be joining us, and she's going to join us with the Diva Diaries, and we've got special guest Sylvia Mitchell, who's expected to join us. Hopefully, everything works out with that. If it doesn't, then, we'll, of course, we'll mention that she was unable to make it, but we're hoping that she is able to make it tonight. Of course, we're going to go around the room. Big Rube is not with us again tonight, but we do expect to have Big Rube back on Ain't No High Step with Marcus J. Next week, when we join you uh, from our normal perch, our spot from 7 to 9, Every single Monday night on MixLR. Ain't no half step with Marcus J. Is proud to say peace to your homeboy, Colin Banks. What's up, man? Not much, man. And you know what? We can just go ahead and tell everybody right now. We got Ruben in the trunk. We're going to keep him in there for about another week. <laughs> All right. He'll be back. All right. We just want to make sure that the ladies love him and everything. So, truth be told, Ruben's in the trunk. That's Ruben, all. That's Ruben, that's Ruben, all. Ruben's in the trunk, and we hiding him. And whatnot, because your man Carlton Banks don't like him. That's he, right. They they, he, they they been beefing the last few weeks, and uh, I think Carlton Banks tied him up and put him in the trunk, and uh, so we're not going to see him probably until next week. It's been two weeks he's been out of the chair, and uh, of course joining us, filling that spot ably uh, as he does from time to time. Very proud and happy to have your man Jay Grizzly Green with us in the building. What's up, bro? Yo, I'm hulking up right now, man. I can just swole up just like Rude. Yeah, you, you, hold, you better, you, you better you, hold your bro. You, you hulking up, man. I'm hulking up, man. I'm so excited to be here. Appreciate you having me, brother. Well, we're going to get it in, man. We got a lot to get into tonight, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on the salutations coming in the live line uh, for the K-Dub report. The National Basketball Association is the man himself. What's up, Dub? What it is, what it is. What's going on, y'all? We doing right. fabulous, man. We gonna go around the league, but uh, from my understanding, there's something you want to get off your chest before we do that. So Already? What's up? It, 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 it wasn't really something that that you know. It was something that I read earlier today in an article, and I would say uh, I, I won't won't take 100 percent of the credit because it was put out there by a listener, Jalil Roberts, and uh, it, it had to do with. Uh, uh, 
the situation with Django and how Spike Lee caught a lot of flack for his criticism of the movie, so on and so forth. And I think it was it was kind of ironic that this particular um, article came out a day after the awards last night. And if I'm not mistaken, the individual that did win something from that particular movie was su- the supporting actor. Uh, the uh, I can't remember uh, <laughs> the guy's name. He was very uh, very funny, but. To get back to what I was thinking about, and it would be interesting to hear what you all, what you guys have, uh, their, your opinion would be in regards to the criticism that Spike Lee got for his criticism of the movie and his criticism of uh, uh, Tarantino. Right. And, you know, the article that I'm reading from, I'll give credit to uh, the article was written by Morris O'Kelly. And it just talked about, you know, if we really took an analytical uh view on the situation a lot of the things that spike lee speaks about are valid points as well as you know the criticism that individuals call i believe um he was called uh, a, a thug by dick gregory and of all people luther campbell of yeah. two live crew actually called spike lee a uh, uncle tom what yeah spike, oh, and, and and you know you don't really think about the things that Spike Lee has done in order for individuals behind him in order to have the opportunity to do that. And you just look at it, and like I stated, you know, if you, you thought about the comments that Spike Lee has made about Tarantino, if you really sat down and did your research, a lot of the things that he says are very valid and that things that we should question. I mean, right. it would be interesting to hear what you what you guys' opinion was that because I remember a couple of shows ago, maybe a month ago, it was lightly talked about, you know, in regards to the to the pressure or the uh, criticism that Spike Lee put out there. Well, uh, in full disclosure, Grizzly was not offended by Django. I thought Django was a superhero, but uh, I think the issue for me when when we hear of Spike, you know, criticized Tarantino not only personally but professionally. Um, that genre that that Tarantino covers is way different than what Spike Lee does. So I'm not I'm totally not defending uh, Tarantino in regards to the you know coming back to what Spike has to criticize him about. But for me, as a, a movie uh, enthusiast and, and, and an artist itself, I mean I like Django. You know now the script I didn't know that. You know, I thought that you know, I didn't think that like uh, Tarantino had all this to do with the script until last night when I saw he won for best screenplay. So he's actually sitting there. It made me, and I'm glad that K Dub brought it up because for you to sit down and to write a script on a movie, a screenplay on a movie, you got to play the dialogue out. You got to you got to get the characters. The characters is fine. If you're taking it back to the Civil War era, it's a slave and a Western and a slave and a bounty hunter. Yeah, that's fine. You you know, because that's what the times was. But to write the screenplay and to sit down and sit there and say, well, I want to use this word left and right, the N word, N word. Nah, bro. That's what I got Spike's back on. I'm like, nah, you can't do that because I think Spike knows as a movie maker, you know, you you put a lot of thought into your craft, and so. Even though nobody is out there doing those black exploitation films, sort of like that, uh, Spike took offense, and even I take offense, knowing that the man sat there and was writing out how he wants this character to be, whether it's art or non-art. You know, I ain't, I ain't having no Kramer moments. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, well, let's think about it like this. First of all, Quentin is known for pushing the envelope, whereas Spike is more trying, trying to, to prove a envelopes. point. He's now he's trying to prove a point. But see, also, Spike, when have you done a movie that was delved into a time when slavery was just ending or still going on? Your movies have always been from the present forward, not from the past back. I'll give you, all right, so, okay, okay. Dub, I want you to chime on this or at least go to this point. That's, that's incorrect. That's incorrect you. because, you know, Spike Lee has done movies about, you know, uh, the good things. Listen, Spike Lee has done Four Little Girls, When the Levees Broke, Malcolm X, Do yep. the Right Thing, Miracle of Santa Ana. Thank and you. you mean to tell me that uh, 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 Luther Campbell of all people is going to call him my Uncle Tom? Yeah. All right, let me, let, me, let, me, let me jump in here. Um, 
First of all, I was very, I was very vocal about having issues with Spike opening up his mouth on this one. And a big part of the reason for me is I think it's hypocritical for a filmmaker to make a movie based in 19 or excuse me, 1858 and not use the N word. So while I understand where you're coming from, Grizz, with regards to him writing the script and going through it line by line and line by line, line by line. I mean, I, we all just got finished watching Roots. They didn't say Roots. No more or no less the N word was prevalent in Roots than it was in Django. And contrary to popular belief, Roots, the screenplay was wit- was written by white folk. It wasn't written by Alex Haley. He wrote the book, obviously. Right. But the screenplay was written by white folk. And he did it that way because he wanted it to be authentic because he didn't want to be too close to it. So I think Spike has personal beef with Quentin Tarantino that totally. may have come out here. We know that Spike has done great things. It's well documented. We ain't got to get into all of that. But... I do think that it's a bit disingenuous for him to attack a man for making a movie based in slavery for for basically using the N word when it's 1858. How the hell you think we talked back then, and how you think we were referred to back then? Now, now let me let me throw something to you. Now you talked about roots, and if we compare the two, well, we have to keep in mind that um, Django is a is a form of fiction. That's not a it's not a true story. Whereas roots is a true story. And basically what, what has been analyzed in this particular article is that if you look at Tarantino's past, you look at uh, Pulp Fiction, you look at Jackie Brown, you look at those particular movies, and even even uh, uh, Reservoir Dogs, mm-hmm. one of the characters, I want to say uh, it was uh, Mr. Mm-hmm. Pink. These are, these are movies that I like, but if you take that basis of his work and you see that con- this is a consistency in his work, you know what I'm saying? Don't you think that, you know, Spike has a, no, you know, I don't. he got a leg to stand on with don't. that in regards to his criticism. I don't. Because if you look at those particular pieces of work, you do have the over-exaggeration of the N-word. I don't, I disagree with you. Well, maybe he, like he, they he, said he, on the he, show last night, uh, the host said that Quentin Tarantino thinks he's black. Or wants well, to be I, black. I, I just I think I think even going there, and I yeah, I caught that. And hey, hey you know it's funny when we say that you say about Bill Clinton, now we say about Quentin. I think that it's disingenuous for black people to attack white people for using the N word when we say it just as much or more than they do. You wouldn't get mad at Quentin Tarantino for using N word in his movie, but then you are gonna sit and listen to NWA and think it's cool. I mean, the, you can't Super have saying. it. You can't have it both ways. But he can't again, come in here and say the word in front of us three. Yeah, and, but you, I don't like when you say it. I know, but he can't come. But in, I don't like when you say it. You, can, you can't rush me like that if I say it, though. I mean, it comes from me no, a different way. To me, no, he has to treat you the same to, way. To me, mm-hmm. me personally, as Marcus J. Right. And and of course, you know, we boys, man. Right. We we under full disclosure, we boys. We hang out on the show and off the show. People around me know how I feel about the word. I'm not going to be the preachy guy that's bringing down the mood. You say the word, you say the word. I'm not going to be correcting you every single time. But I if you with me, but if you with me, you know how right. I roll. Totally. So if you're going to be Jay Grizzy, Carlton Banks, K Dub, or Quentin Tarantino, and you driving the N word, to me they're interchangeable. There's you, no difference. You're too fair. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just keeping it real. You're I don't want to spend, a, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, K Dub. I'm going to give you the last word on the subject. I mean, I, I, I listen, man. I'm, I'm pretty much right along. I think that you know we do need to consciously, as a group, you know, and as individuals, you know, kind of take take our own little self evaluation and saying the N word. I, I can honestly say, hey, man, you know, I, I'm guilty, you know, and I understand that, and I'm trying to uh, uh, work on that as an individual. But I don't think that because you know he criticized, or even we, we have the right to criticize. We have the right to criticize and ask that you know what I'm saying uh, 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 people be taken into taken t- that being taken into account. You know what I'm saying, and, and that's just my my opinion. I kind of side more with Spike. You know, um, I mean, we all know that it <laughs> it's a lot. It, even though we would like things to be equal, we all know that it's not, and it can't be equal because there's a couple. They, listen, if we was to say the wrong thing on this radio show right now, we guarantee ain't no half step with Marcus J would not be on it on the radio next or on the air next week. All right. Well, that's fair enough. I mean, I, I disagree with you, but I, I, like I said, I give you the last word and you got the last word. Let's move on for the reason why we got you on the live line. National Basketball Association last week's trade deadline came and went. Anything big happened? Not really. 
Absolutely, man. Uh, I guess you could say the biggest thing that happened was uh, J.J. Reddy going to uh, Milwaukee, which basically lets me know that Orlando is looking forward to being uh, not good for probably the next two to three years or what have you, unloading basically one of their better players. I can assume that Jameer Nelson probably won't be there next year as well. Um, other than that, you know, a lot of the talk was about who didn't go anywhere. You know, uh, uh, you didn't have Josh Smith uh, going anywhere from um, – from uh, Atlanta, uh, you didn't have the big one of uh, Dwight Howard going anywhere. The talks with him going to possibly going to uh, New Jersey uh, or, or even other places such as that. So, you know, like I said, a lot of the things that you didn't hear were the bigger stories. Um, there were some moves you had uh, Anthony Murrow traded uh, from Atlanta to Dallas for Dante Jones. Um, I would say... Uh, for some Nick fans that's listening, you have Rodney Brewer uh, actually moved to Oklahoma City for a draft pick and some cash, which opened up an opportunity for the Knicks to sign Kenya Martin to a ten-day ten-day uh, contract. Um, you had uh, Sebastian Telfair going to Toronto for a uh, Hamad Haddadi He's still and, uh, in the draft pick going from uh, Phoenix. But for some people, also you 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 might want might not want to underestimate Washington and Boston making a trade of uh, Jordan Crawford uh, is going to Boston and uh, Leonardo Barbosa is going to uh, Washington. Um, that, you know, Jordan Crawford, for, for, the bas- for the people that watch basketball, Jordan Crawford, Crawford is a very gifted offensive player. Yeah, he can ball. And uh, for Boston to get him, you know, that kind of allows them to get some points off the bench. Real quick, I uh, don't want to go backward, but I always want to try to make sure that we get folks' comments. And I want to say peace to Steven from the Dating Pool blog, uh, who is uh, a fan of the Dating Pool blog and uh, is, is very pivotal in giving comments and things of that sort to the author Charisma and things of that sort. I want to say peace to him. This is his first time listening. He's All got right. a comment on the Django issue. Uh, the issue was Django was made into an action movie based on slavery. Personally, no one should use the N-word. Uh, we got Madrika, who's also listening, um, who says Django may have been a work of fiction. However, in order to be authentic to the era of the movie, the N-word was used heavily. Also, we can't give each other the license to use the N-word, then turn around and bash one another. Don't want to have comments from the crew. I just wanted to get the oh. comments. I just wanted to get the comments from the listeners. The host. I just wanted to get comments <laughs> from the cut listeners. Cut out my call. Right. The re- reason why is because I don't want I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of K Dub's uh, shine here. However, however, uh, if if we have time, we can definitely bring that up during what the hell because I do think that it's important stuff. Uh, and I want to thank K Dub for bringing it up real quick. When we talked about Dub the uh, trade the Knicks made for Ronnie Brewer to go to Oklahoma City, they got a draft pick back. You did mention that they did it. Solely to open up a roster spot for Kenya Martin. Don't want to spend a lot of time on the Knicks because I do want to move on to some of the other comments that we have. But what is the prospect of Kenya Martin's performance uh, in New York? We know he didn't play last night against Philadelphia. Knicks win for the first time in five <laughs> tries. Uh, they got a big one in Wednesday. And then, of course, they play Miami on Sunday. Uh, so what's Kenya Martin going to do? He signed a 10-day, but I don't think anybody thinks he's only going to be there for 10 days. No. Well, uh, that's absolutely right. You know, 10-day at this particular point, Coach Woodson talked about how uh, they want to at least right now get him in so he can uh, get a little bit of conditioning back on the floor. You know, so it's a whole lot different from running on the treadmill uh, and actually running down up and down the court and get acclimated to the system. Um, Kenny Moore probably brings two things that the uh, Knicks, I wouldn't say lack, but they uh, are looking for, which is tough defense and uh, kind of a, a, a an attitude. An attitude such as Tyson Chandler, you have another what you would call a bulldog on the floor that, you know, defensively is going to be a ball hog. He's going to get you some rebounds, and he's just going to be that tough guy that you need on the court to maybe give that foul to prospective guards and, and wing players coming down the lane uh, trying to uh, trying to score. Yeah. You know? So I think that he adds just a layer of toughness to the team. Yeah, and I, I agree with you, k Dub. As a Nick fan, I mean, Tyson Chandler, other you know, other than him, he's the enforcer. So who do we have other than him to collect more fouls on? Let's say a LeBron James, or let's say a, a what's the guy in Indiana that played the wing? Uh, help me out. Um, Major or or basic or, or the guy that's coming back from the All Star that they, they had. Um, what's the kid's name that's coming off an of injury now? 
I don't know who he is. Danny Granger. Danny, Danny, Danny Granger. Granger. Yeah, like he, he you know, you know, Kmart year. probably get a, he good for at least a good clothesline in the playoffs. So, <laughs> you know, even 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 guarding LeBron, you know, he, that's a good defense. That's a player that you not when you're in the playoffs or if you let's say predicting right now that the Knicks get to two or third to two or three. And for the listening audience, we talk about the Knicks because we got Knicks fans in the building, right? <laughs> But we're just saying, like, uh, even if we get the two or three spot, we're going to see Miami, hopefully, in the playoffs. And so let's say LeBron uh, LeBron getting 35 as opposed to LeBron getting a 25. There's a big difference. And so w- wouldn't you agree that, that that's a good pickup for the Knicks? Oh, yeah. I, I definitely think that it's a good pickup for the Knicks. It bolsters you the front line. Um, it gives you uh, another individual, whereas you're not – when you get into foul situations, you get into bad situations. You know, I think that some Nick fans would rather have someone such as a Kenya Martin out there than rather calling on Kurt Thomas. And you know, not not taking anything away from Crazy Kurt, because right. when he does go out there, he just shows how much of a true professional he is. He's ready to play. And he gives you something while he's out there. That's right. But um, you Re- know, real, real any, quick, any, Dub, any fan, real quick, Dub. Before you uh, go on, Steven is hitting us again. He says the Knicks will never win because Carmelo. Always want to be in the middle of a fight. Please tell, tell uh, please would you, respond to that, K Dog. Respond to that, and then move on to LeBron, and then we're gonna jump around the league. Always wants to be into a fight. I still haven't seen a fight yet. You know, the last fight he, that he, he actually said, had he's was saying a that years he, ago with, with Nate Robinson. He's saying that he's not mature. What? Hey, hey listen, man, listen. That's what? your own. That may be your own opinion, but at the end of the day, numbers don't lie. You know, he's already proven that he's he's a, a changed individual, which you can understand someone coming in the league as a 20, what, 22-year-old, 20-year-old, 19-year-old, right. of course, as time goes on, you're going to even chill just like a regular person does. I but that, I, I don't want to take anything away from, you know, that's a that's a, that's something that people say, and to be honest with you, you know, every two weeks is something different about the Knicks or Carmelo or what have you. I mean, just just like him, he has to go on and, and, and continue to play basketball, you know. At the end of the day, Melo gets buckets. Hey, that was Stephen A. Say he gets buckets. He, he gets, yeah, he, he gets, gets buckets, buckets. But still, you, there's a certain maturity level you expect man, out of a hey, player. I you agree. on my squad, he gets buckets. I, I agree with Carlton, you know, to a degree, and I and to a degree, I agree with Stephen. Not that the Knicks won't win because of it, but you know, this year I have seen some issues with maturity with him. He's had his breakout year. He's having his best year, in my opinion, as a pro. However, when you see the other team get under his skin and get him frustrated. He does a lot of complaining, and those are usually the games that they somehow Well, he ain't Dwight off. Howard you know, those, are, those are the games that he somehow gets off his game a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to see, as a Knicks fan, i like to see Carmelo as a leader because they follow him. He's a leader. I agree. So a lot of what his te- te- uh, his temperament is is what the team's temperament is. i like to see him maybe control himself a little bit more because, you know, I watch the broadcast. I hear the commentators, but I can formulate my own opinion. I happen to agree agree with the commentators they complain too much yes the calls are not going against you right i'm yes. watching the games i see it i see it i see it but it's like getting pulled over by the cops at the end of the day you got to eat that some days you got to eat that yeah there's a way that you go about getting your respect from them but complaining to them and cussing them out ain't how you do it you're still getting buckets you and still- if i got the scouting <laughs> report on you I'm going to do everything I can to do what I need to do. Absolutely. There's a goon on every team. Garnett, right? There's a goon on every team. Absolutely. Dub, San Antonio Spurs, we always know that that's a team of yours who you always like to point out for keeping it moving all the time, no matter what. You know, they're like a well-oiled machine. What's going on with the Spurs? Dude, hold on. Man? Before you answer hey, that, dude need to cut his braids for real. <laughs> 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 For real, K Dub, speak on that first. Does the swing man uh, in San Antonio? I would uh, tend to agree with you. Yeah, Harry, man, that's Terry off. Uh, a few other cats that got braids. Right, right. right. They need to go ahead and uh, Teddy P that and let it go. Right. Um, but uh, San Antonio, man, guess what? All all year we've been talking about Oklahoma City, the Clippers, New York, Miami. San Antonio is forty five and thirteen with the best record in the league, straight up. I mean, they got Tim Duncan. They still got old man Tim Duncan out there. You know, Mr. Fundamentals. And he's, he's, he's out there giving some, giving, giving, giving his all. You know, you got Tony Park. You still got Manu Ginobili, Steven Jackson. I mean, you have a number of players that know their roles. Here's the thing. And I had a discussion with someone about San Antonio. San Antonio basically is around about the same, uh, caliber that they were last year. And what happened is that when the playoffs came, you know, they were, they meet, they met up with a younger team. That kind of ran them out the gym, and it will be. It's going to be, you know, kind of. It's going to be interesting to see how that, how that, 
how that comes into play when the season comes, when it's the playoff time and they run into a team that may be uh, out there just trying to trying to actually just play for their lives. You know, Houston, you have uh, uh, Utah, you have the, the Lakers right now back. I won't, I won't say they're back in the mix, but, you know, you know, a team. If a team goes on a losing streak and the Lakers continue to, you know, chip away at it by the end of the season, you never know. The Lakers could be in a position to be in that eighth place uh, position, and yeah. then at that particular point, you know, all bets are off. And I think that in the Western Conference, the Lakers are a team that, you know, you if they were to make the playoffs, you may not want to play them. But in, back to San Antonio, with them being a pretty older team, you know, will it come down to a situation as last year of them losing to a younger, faster uh, faster team? I know that you would make Big Rube real happy if he was here with us to hear you say what you said about uh, the Lakers apparently trying to make a run up the standards and jump over some teams to get back to their eighth seed and be relevant uh, after the middle of April. But uh, Good word, relevant. Irrelevant. But um, speaking of the Lakers, let's keep it in, uh, in the stable center for a minute. Uh, and then we'll move to Dallas, kind of uh, a coast story there. Uh, anytime you got a player that's got beef with an, an owner, that cannot go well. What the hell is going on with that? Well, uh, no, it, it wasn't a, a beef from what I understand. It was just a comment that was made on Twitter by Mark Cuban saying that, you know, if the uh, Lakers, and I think he said it in tongue-in-cheek, uh, if the Lakers were really thinking about some things, you know, maybe – uh, by amnesty and Kobe Bryant, that may be an option. So, and if anyone's know, uh, basically amnesty would basically meaning buying out Kobe Bryant. Let me let me ask you this. I'm getting a hit on the Mix LR page. What's up, Sad? Uh, Sad wants to know what's up with Memphis. Man, what's going on with uh, Sad? Is, <laughs> Sad is from Tennessee, so he want to know what's going on oh, with Memphis. Memphis is 37 and 18 right now. Uh, they sitting in the uh, fourth spot. Um, yeah, the fourth spot. But you know what? I, 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 Memphis went from having a perimeter player in Rudy Gay that was one of the few players in the league that could make his own shot to kind of, to go. On, you, you bring in. Um, I'm sorry. You bring in uh, uh, Tyshawn. Um, oh man, I'm 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 wilding right Memphis, now. Memphis. That's what um, you what you, you trade said. Away, basically, K-Dow. what I'm saying is that with Memphis, you trade in a way a perimeter player that could have got his own shot, and basically now you're rolling with Paul Gasol. I'm sorry, Mark Gasol and and uh, and zero Ebo, yeah. You know, and I, I I just wonder how how much will that how much will that hurt. When it comes playoff time, when it becomes a half court game, yeah, said ain't happy about it. Yeah. He hated that trade. He said it's saying he hated the trade. Then yeah, what did they say yeah, exactly to Toronto? Because you know, even though uh, Rudy Gay, they were wanting to get rid of Rudy Gay or what have you. You know, that is one of the better players in the league, and it's kind of sad because, and I'm sure that he'll he'll agree with me. It's kind of sad that when he became a free agent a couple of years ago, you know, they was at his door at twelve oh one, and he was actually the next day was supposed to go and check out Chicago. Yeah. And then you have a good team in Memphis, and one of the top five teams at one time, one particular time in the league, and you get traded away. What does that say about? What does that say to your fans? Yeah, as far as you being they good, Jerry West back trade away a piece that, that kept you good. Last question: We we kind of jumped into Indiana, but we didn't really get into them. Let me just ask you real quick: They beat the hell out the Knicks last week. That was a burst. I mean, they, they beat the hell out the that Knicks, and then they slowly but surely Quarters. making their way up. They've eclipsed the Knicks for the two spot. They now have the two spot. Knicks are down to three. Uh, they got a two game lead over uh, um, the team that plays in Brooklyn. Uh, what's the deal with Indiana? Are they for real? Are they waiting on Danny Granger to come back? I'm not sure if he's back or not. I guess you could tell me. But, I mean, it's almost like they're going to pick up a trade or a free agent in the middle of the season because we know that he's all-star caliber. They've been playing this good, similar to how Chicago could be when uh, when Rose comes back. Talk to me real quick about Indiana and Chicago before we wrap up. Indiana, Indiana is chipping away. Indiana is actually taking over the second spot from New York, thirty-five and twenty-one. They six games behind Miami, which is just right now they're just coasting into the playoffs. Indiana did get Danny Granger back the other day. He uh, scored one basket in his first game back. I think he was uh, one for seven in that particular game. But uh, Indiana has Paul George. You know, he's rolled with them. You had David West, who used to play for uh, the Hornets. You have a good nucleus of cats that have bought into – it's a young team that's bought into their coach, and they're just, they're just continuing to, to move along. I mean, I was, I was utterly embarrassed at, you know, the performance that the Knicks had against them. And, you know, it isn't a fluke. I mean, 
35 and 21 basically speaks to them. They're on a uh, eight, they're eight and two in their last two games. They won four games straight. You know, they're looking very good. Chicago, Chicago has kind of you know been kind of up and down. They're, third, they're nine games out of that first spot in the Eastern Conference, 32 and 24. They're sitting at the uh, uh, sixth position. Um, they they've been kind of they were up and down the last ten games. They're four and six. Uh, going into the break, they were looking pretty good, but you know, as of late, they haven't really been uh, you know uh, looking like the team that they were before the break. But one encouraging thing is that uh, if a lot of people saw the game last night, uh, they showed uh, Derrick Rose going through his um, going through working out, and he, he was looking pretty good. But again, you know, uh, it's a big difference from going from running around, taking shots, doing sprints, or what have you, actually being able to be in a game, cutting and moving around. You know, he, he could be a, just like any person that comes back from that type of injury, you know, you could be a, a crossover away from being out for even longer. Right, and what I will say, if I was a voting person for MVP this year, I would vote for Derrick Rose because it, I think if Rose was playing... It shows his value. Right, if, if, if it shows his value to that team, and they're... Uh, five six seven seeded team in the east but if you put him there they would be up there with the knicks and with miami with indiana so you know it'd be interesting to see i know there was talk that he may sit out for the rest of the season and come back you know that's a decision that that young man has to make for himself and his career and his family you know if i was the bulls i mean honestly i wouldn't rush him back you know, that's your franchise, and he's showing you that right now. Ain't no half step with Marcus J.K. Dell. We're going to leave it there. We're going to take our first break of the night, my brother. When we come back, we got Endosi on your brile, an aspiring filmmaker based in the Atlanta area. He's coming on the live line to talk to us about filmmaking. Uh, then we got some what the hell. We got the Diva Diaries dub holder line. Going to take that break. Marcus J. Ain't no half stepping. Be back in a minute. 